My name is Brenton Bostick. My talk is titled Parsing the Wolfram Language. In this talk, I will give an overview of Wolfram language syntax. I will present a new parser for the Wolfram language, and I will give applications of the new parser, including profiling and code coverage. All right, welcome. My name's Brenton Bostick. I'm going to be talking about parsing the Wolfram language. I'm gonna blast through a lot of stuff right now, and I'm not gonna be taking a lot of questions until the end, all right. Um, so the outline is, I'm gonna be talking about Wolfram language syntax um, and presenting a new parser for the Wolfram language that I've been working on for the, the last year and a half or two years or so, uh, and then talk about instrumentation technology that uses that parser, mainly profiling and coverage analysis. All right, so talking about the Wolfram language syntax. About a thousand different long names, two thirds of which are letter-like uh, characters and a third are punctuation, uh, things like this, people might be familiar with or not. 80 or so ASCII operators like span, double factorial, and two-way rule. Uh, about 300 or so non-ASCII operators like all of these super crazy things sometimes you see, invisible application. All right, so just to quiz everyone quickly, how well do you know Wolfram language syntax? As a warm up, how do you tokenize real numbers? If you have only seen this sequence of characters so far, is that always going to be a real number? Just yell out yes or no. No, it's not because you could have turned that into a rule and that now has turned into a rule expression. All right. Uh, is that always going to be a rule assuming nothing about what comes after. No, it's not, because that could turn into the dot operator. All right. What are all of these? <laughs> these are all very different from each other. Um, some aren't even valid syntax, but I'm not gonna go through which ones are which. Are these equivalent if you care, if knowing that alternatives, the ordering inside alternatives does not matter, are these the same? No, they're not, because we're, colon has different, well, yeah. Uh, and these are not input cells, but colon has different precedents. I'm going to just do that so you can actually double and triple click to be able to see how things group. That groups the whole thing, but that is only what that alternatives is there. So no, they're not the same thing. You have to be very careful about that. How does this parse? Not how you might intend. How does that parse? Similarly, I, don't, I mean, maybe you do, but I don't want to assume, but I know at least for me, it's surprising. Um, naming a pattern on both sides of a branch of alternatives is completely fine, right? No, it's not fine because that does not do what you think it does. Because that is what that alternative statement is. And I know people have written that code because I've written that code before. What does this parse to? Serious question, what does this parse to? Well, I mean, span is involved, yes, but. Yeah, however, it depends on what you're asking because if you actually ask the kernel what it thinks, it will say something else. And this just highlights a problem that the, there's not complete parser parity between the kernel and the front end. And so, and also relatedly, what does this parse to? If you, I mean it fails, I don't know, but should it fail, because we have factorial, I, I don't even know if it, I don't even know anymore. Anyway, <laughs> quick fire, what is that? I, I don't know, I'm, I'm honestly asking, yeah. <laughs> but it's also because, well, I hold, yeah, I mean, because it's, yeah. Okay, because um, it's being set, because that's only how that's grouping, but um, it depends on if you're in the kernel or if you're in the front end. And okay, so that, what does that parse to? What does that parse to? And what does that parse to? Which is actually real code that is kind of scary because that might not be, this whole thing might not be doing what you think it does because that might not be what you think it is. All right, are there operators that are both prefix and infix? Well, I mean, I probably wouldn't be asking if like, the answer was no, but uh, plus and minus people might know about, span, which is crazy, bang, which is crazy, plus plus and minus minus, 
are all examples of this. So, I mean, definitively, yes. Um, yes. Uh, symbols may have non-ASCII characters. I mean, you know, we have alpha as a symbol, you know, and everything. What, are there any non-ASCII symbols that are actually in system? I mean, yeah. So, you know, the formal, yeah, so super cool. Um, are there any binary operators that are not in fix? Think Polish notation or reverse Polish notation. Because the differential D binds to X, and so integral actually takes two arguments. And, well, that's already defined. I mean, yeah, okay, I could clear that, but. Um, yeah, so maybe a little bit obscure, but that's the business of what a parser has to handle. So anyway, moral of the story is Wolfram language syntax is complicated. Uh, tokenizing is actually harder than parsing, in my opinion, but that's, I mean, a subjective thing. Uh, there are lots of operators in Wolfram language with unintuitive precedences, and colon is its own beast that I'm not going to be getting into. So, why write a new parser if it seems to be under the old parser seems to completely understand the language? Well, there are limitations because you can only uh, have a, I mean, it's around 256, I, give or take, so I just said 260, but you'll only have a predefined depth of expressions that can be parsed down uh, until you start running into errors. And 250 ain't that big, and so in the real world, people have actually hit this limit before. You get an error, what's the error? Because, I mean, I know, I, you know there's no reporting, and weird things like this parsing differently than this in the kernel, yeah. So um, the kernel and the front end are not completely in parity, which can lead to a lot of head scratching. And so I think these are all good motivations for a new parser where you could achieve parity and answer, address, ad, at least address all of these points in some way. So, all right, and then just for Halloween, I wanted to throw this in. Uh, don't evaluate these in your kernel. Um, <laughs> just, just don't, yeah, okay. So design goals of a new parser, I'm not even gonna do it, because um, I need to still give my presentation. Uh, design goals of a new parser, I think I wanted to maintain clean separation between these different layers, um, in which I've called the byte stream, the source character stream, the Wolfram language character stream, token stream, and expression stream. Uh, bytes are at the lowest level, and expressions are at the highest level, and this is all stuff in between. I'm not gonna be talking about what they all com completely are, but I can answer questions afterwards. Um, and maintaining clean separation between levels of abstraction between concrete syntax, aggregate syntax, and abstract syntax. And aggregate syntax is actually a term of art that I've made up because I felt a need for in this in-between state, uh, which I'll talk about later, and, uh, and better error handling, reporting, and recovery. So some, little, some different concepts. A source character, there are eight source characters in this selection right now, but there's only one Wolfram language character there is one, one source character here and one Wolfram language character there. So ho hopefully that's enough explanation for people. Um, trivia is what I'm calling comments, white space, new lines, and line continuations. And aggregate syntax is therefore concrete syntax, but with trivia removed. Um, concrete syntax, think of boxes on the front end, and abstract syntax, think of full form in the kernel, roughly. I know they're different, but anyway. So some implementation details. It is modeled as a Pratt parser, which is a recursive descent parser that associates semantics with tokens instead of grammar rules. Um, some line of code outputs for Jason Harris. Um, he was asking, yeah, it's, there's about 18, 17, whatever, thousand line, 14, whatever lines of C++ code. Um, and you talk about implementing them as there are various parslets. I didn't make up that term. Uh, in the parser that you address various things, you know, binary operators, you have group operators, you have infix, postfix, and prefix, and then you have to address little special cases that maybe this list is a little bit too long, but that's the Wolfram language for you. Colon has special things equal because of dot, sorry, equality parslets and vector inequality parslets because we like to get all of those together in one unit differently. Uh, trailing things that can be just infix but are trailing like commas and semicolons 
Integral has its own thing. Semi-span has its own thing. And each one of the ternary operators have to have their own special parslets also. Um, so yeah. So anyway, new parser. It's called, it's implemented in the AST packlet. So you can just do this. And so this is the output of parse string, which is the main function that you'll use. You'll see there's a call node, a leaf node, which is the head, and leaf node, which are the two arguments to uh, the plus that I gave. Um, so you might wonder, maybe not wonder, what the output of the same thing would be. And look, it's the same thing with different source, though, because you know we space them out differently. The source is specifying what line and column the uh, leaf started on and what line and column the leaf ended on. And it's um, inclusive, not inclusive and exclusive for string takes benefit, even though it's annoying because now you can't specify zero length characters, zero length leaves, but whatever. Um, and so everything's all on one line here. And so maybe it's a bit redundant, but it gets pretty useful when you're dealing with files. Um, so yeah, parsing strings, like I was just showing, if you want to keep tra track of concrete syntax, you would use concrete parse string, where you now have comments embedded in wherever you had comments, and it's all very nice. Um, but you might not just be dealing with strings, you might want to also be dealing with files. And so I have an example of the Colats problem. Um, this has other code in it that I'll be demonstrating later, but it's a common thing. It's just an implementation of the Colats function. And so you can parse this file and get a big chunk of stuff back. Um, I assume it's correct. I'm going to keep scrolling. Um, and concrete parse gives even more structure back. Yeah, like white space, yeah. Um, a lot of scrolling, okay. Um, so one benefit that you immediately start seeing is that there's no longer the same stack depth limit as before, and just to verify I'm not like there's not something missing in the elided stuff. Uh, this creates a fully nice full form expression. You can actually go even higher, which is this gonna take, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> Why did that not even return? Oh man. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, oh well. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't have done that. All right. Uh, okay, I think we're good to go. So. Um, and then a little bit of cheating here for good formatting. I'm going to show that we have good error reporting with the linter doing the actual formatting, but the parser is actually doing the heavy lifting. Um, we can actually see that we get salient error messages depending on what the error is. And the second example actually illustrating that we have good recovery after there's a parsing error, it continues and tells you that you know, you're still multiplying something by three, um, even though it's complete gibberish at that point, but you might wanna go back and actually fix the problem instead of just dead stopping right there where the weird uh, plus was. So some applications of the new parser I'm going to show involve instrumentation of source code, which means rewriting source code here, um, usually around the uh, entering and exiting of functions to do various uh, you know, uh, ledger, keeping track, tidying type things, uh, mainly Profiling and coverage reporting are the two main applications I'm gonna be showing. But like Tom said, was touching on in his talk, you could also start applying code transformations like recognizing that append to inside of a list may not be that good of an idea and transforming that automatically in some way uh, to um, something more general that would be more uh, performant. So profiling Wolfram language code, um, I had to quit then anyway, so it's just as well. Um, so I'm gonna be using the same Colats example that people may have noticed. I artificially put a pause of 0.1 seconds in, but take a sec, oh, I think it's already done, yep. So this is a, it just returns a list of the iterates of uh, the Colats starting 27, goes down to one, you get a bunch of data. Um, verifying that the data that comes out has stuff in it, we, we process it, and then we end up getting a report and I will blow that up for people's benefit. That might, well, yeah. So you can see that 99.56% of the time is spent in the function in the .m file at line 29. And if we look at line 29, this is this definition, 
hey, and look, there's a call to dummy function, which is calling pause of 0.01, like however many times it was, and that's probably what all the time was. And in fact, it was. So we can actually get data-driven, we can use data to help augment our intuition about why code might be slow, because a lot of times your intuition might be wrong about what code is slow, and it's much better to actually get something, numbers to tell you where to look and what the problem is. Uh, I'm not taking any questions. No, I'm sorry. What? <laughs> That's a good question because it's actually kind of tricky because I put it inside of a condition. This condition fires before you've actually entered the function, the dummy function. And so there's like this whole explanatory comment up here. Um, in code, <laughs> you could add a wrapper of cult. You could actually get that analysis. Yeah, you know. If you knew, if you instrumented every call site of that function, it could then tell you the time difference between I've started to enter this function and now I'm actually inside of this function. And it, like, there's a lot of stuff that goes on that takes up a lot of time if you're not paying attention. So, yeah, good, good, good question. Um, oh, that's the report. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so then also coverage reporting of Wolfram language code that people um, would hopefully find useful going to be instrumenting the same, the same code. Just verifying a lot of stuff. That's, yeah, different formatting. All right. However, this is now using external commands to actually um, generate the HTML and stuff. But um, here, I'm not going to go out to the shell, but uh, you know, it, it's reporting 80% coverage and some screenshots, but um, I actually still have the report, so, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, yep. And so using LCOV and gen HTML, you can go here and see, I think I can, some li this line's executed 70 times, this is only executed once, um, 123 times, this line is executed zero times because I define immediately after it another definition for integer, uh, that it takes uh, that is actually the thing that gets hit. So that's coverage reporting in the Wolfram language thanks to the new parser technology. Okay, so the future, uh, immediately, immediate goals for the future is a formatter for Wolfram language code, pretty printer type things that people might have even been asking about in the mor you know, this morning. Uh, we're actively working on a new formatter. Uh, if you have any ideas for how you'd like your code formatted, let me know, um, and then just other idea, source map, uh, there's a pack, the new package format supporting that would be very nice. Rewriting the whole thing as an LL1 parser because it's actually, well, yeah, as I, yeah, it crashed, so I thought I could, yeah. Uh, you're still able to hit stack depth limits, but just not as, you know, the same before. Um, and actually using the new kernel to return expressions directly to the kernel, and then after all that, actually integrating back into the kernel and having all of this stuff for free, so. Thank you. Uh, come to my talk, Finding Bugs in the Wolfram Language, at 4.30, and, and that's it. Cool. Thank you. <laughs>